Uh, as Mr. Speaker already said, I was born in Africa, lived uh, almost all of my life in Africa, collaborating with Africans. My father was an um, agricultural, uh, tropical agricultural consultant, working in sisal. In these years, sisal plantations were the supply for all sorts of rope worldwide, at the cost of huge tracts of uh, rainforest. As a little kid, I learned that the more you deforest, the more successful you are in agriculture. So that is what we've been doing for a long time. On the other hand, we had Africans eking their life out of that same rainforest that was so chopped down by the, by the Europeans that I thought, there's something wrong in here. When I was 10, I started venturing into the rainforest the ones that were left, and one thing struck me. The amount of plants, the amount of birds, the amount of fish, the amount of insects, all had to disappear for spiky roads of sisal from here up to the horizon. And that was development. I knew that this was a wrong that had to be rectified that it was going to be such a Herculean task in the next 50 years, I didn't know that. Let me now come back to the present situation. Um, if you take the last six months in account, only on climate calamities, we have had uh, floodings, we've had dust storms, we had landslides, we had uh, volcanic eruptions, and the amount of um, damage that that has done only in six months' time, is being reflected in hectares affected and casualties uh, lost. What is much more important is that you calculate how much in years has been destroyed vegetation-wise in six months' time. How much can regenerate in, si in the same six months from that, from that volume? When you deduct the volume of regeneration from the volume of destruction, you have exactly know what the exponential desertification factor is in our world. And I tell you, it's harrowing. The desertification grows by the year. So every year it will get worse and worse and worse, unless we decide to do something. Okay, what do we have to do? You calculate the volume in years of vegetation that's being lost per half year, because now we talk about half years and years. You take the affected hectares and you multiply them by two. This multiplication of hectares, you multiply it with the years of vegetation that has been destroyed, and that is the amount of hectares that have to be rehabilitated after That is the way how we bring our climate back under control. Okay, I would like to show you a film now on the practicalities that we've done in the African field with regards to this, to this uh, development, and I'll give some comment on it. Okay, this is the technique of contour trenching. You see a cross-section here. You see the sun is heating the, desert, uh, the deserted earth. Now the trenches are being dug. They can be dug by bulldozer or be dug by hand. The rain that falls on the land completely is, is, soaks into the, into the soils. The growth that it generates is evergreen growth. So you get your grass back, you get your shrubs back, you get your trees back, and it will never dry up again. Okay, here you see how the trenches are being dug. They are being dug on the, on the um, contours in the landscape. The, the contour in the landscape is uh, on the same level.
So all the water that falls in a certain area is being stored subsurface. That subsurface storage makes that even deserts will get green again, and it happens in a very, very short period. Areas that have not been treated, whether there's a lot of rainfall, you get erosion gullies. And this is something that will not stop. So your, your, your landscape completely dries up. Where it's been gone to trench, it will be evergreen forever. Even with mild rainstorms on, on non contour trench land, you get erosion because the, the, the soil starts soaking the, the, the rain up and it will uh, discharge from that landscape. Now, this is a very nice one. We can create drinking water wherever we want in the world. I only need 100 millimeters of rainfall per year, and I can create drinking water for people. You do not have to pump it. It is the hydrostatic pressure from the top that pushes the water into your system. So you don't have to pump, you don't have to clear, it's always there. So here you see again contour trenching, and uh, you decide as a farmer where you want that water to come up, where you give your cattle drinking water. You will see soon this is an under, underground uh, sub subsurface flow, and you direct it into the direction where you want it to surface and you, where you can get it subsurface again. You see, you stop it, you make a stone wall, and you, you bring it subsurface again wherever you want it. So you can create land with per perennial water wherever you want, at certain circumstances. So by creating this, this drinking water for cattle, you create drinking water for plants, and your plants are as again, food for cattle, this must be good news for the meat eater we, that we just had before here, is that you create grass and plants for your cattle by creating drinking water for your cattle. This is the evaporation that you get from, from a forested area, generating your own rain. It's all very simple. No, serious. <laughs> okay, now, now we come to an issue. There's a lot of rivers that go to, to the depressions in the landscape and then all the water disappears. What we've developed is a system that river water can be dispersed into your, your uh, contour train system, so you regenerate the forest. This is what we had, uh, actually do in the Kilimanjaro area, to increase the forest around the Kilimanjaro, and I'll show you later why we are doing it and how it works. So that is the dispersal wall, and that's the centralizing wall. You make stone walls, Excavate the dam because you need drinking water. 
there your low, low river flow comes in. High river water, which is always silted, has to go th straight through. It's nice, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now you see an overland sheet flow that fills all the trenches, and you see your, your under, undercurrent. Then your undercurrent is being hit by the wall, by the, by the dam, and make sure that that dam will never dry up, because you've got so much water evaporation-free in your soils, that that water, if you, the cat will drink it, the water will come up again, nice and cool. And again, you see the vegetation come up. Which means that you can handle more, much more cattle than before. And that's good for sausages. <laughs> yeah. Again, you see the evaporation that you create in the landscape, turning it back into rainfall. I mean, it's all cyclic, you see what I mean? It's not you go from A to B, no, you, you keep cycling. Okay, this is deforestation. Now we come to the, to the issue that everyone seems to be interested in. What you see, Kilimanjaro now has got about 200 square kilometers of rainforest on the slopes. Your rainstorms that come from the Indian Ocean are heavily loaded. They only have to go up for two or 300 meters and they're completely uh, discharged. What we've done with these units to push the water into the field again is increase the rainforest by, by another 200 square kilometers. So your lower slopes are getting forest as well. This is a different story of the evaporation. I mean, Kilimanjaro, in fact, is, a, is an incontinent um, uh, mountain. All the water drains into certain areas, and then it starts to evaporate. Here you see the increase of forest. OK, your rainstorms come in. They come over the lower slopes. They discharge a little bit of their rain, go to the summit, and discharge the, 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 the rest of their volumes. And you get your ice cap back. It's simple. You see? <laughs> what are you laughing? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, this is what we've done for uh, Mali. Uh, Bamako is the capital of Mali. Uh, lies on the Niger River. Um, they pump their drinking water from the Niger River. It's polluted, they have to filter it, they have to pump it. This is the, the Bamako towns, about one and a half to two million people. That are the runoff areas from Bamako town. You can't trench them, which means that it's about 200 square kilometers. That means that all your rainfall will go into your agricultural land and drain into Bamako town and come up as consumable water. No pumping required, nothing. And at the same time, you make your land green, so you can have a lot of cattle. <laughs> you see, that's how it works. That's El Nino. Okay, now I'll show you a couple of examples in the Bamako region, what it does for food supply, water supply, we've had it, and energy supply. Okay, this system now you know. No. 
for clarity, Bamako's got one rain season per year, so they have one harvest per year. Now that you start to contour trench, you have four maize harvests per year. That is because the water in the, in the subsurface volume is just supplying enough water. You make drought-resistant agriculture. In fact, you solve the, the food problem of the world by doing this. Is, uh, I don't know whether it's the third or the fourth, but you, you, get, you make four, four halves per year. Okay, this, this biodiesel production, you gain it from uh, planting Jatropha. But we plant Jatropha in such a way that your cattle can come in and you force your cattle to graze like that. Can you see what I mean? Yeah, it's open there, it's open there, etc., etc., etc. Because on the moment you start to contour trench, you have to put 1,600 head of cattle per square kilometers. Otherwise, everything gets bush and it will become un unproductive in agricultural terms. You see? <laughs> that is a lot of beef, I tell you. <laughs> Councillor. May I introduce you to my friend? Councillor. Karibu. <laughs> I stand in front of you to present life, destiny, change ideas. My name is Olasai Elel from Kenya. This is my first time being out of Africa. So ever. <laughs> but not for leisure, but to witness what we have seen in the film. It is true and reality. An urgency need for positive change is high. I met Peter Westerfield 10 years ago, a man who came with an idea of changing desert land to fertile land, as you have seen here. My community gave out 2,000 hectares of land for rehabilitation. As I speak now, we have grass, trees, livestock, wildlife, once again. As I said, an agency needs high, as I witness and partner in Peter's work. I do believe it's you and us who can make this desperate earth back to abundance, and plenty by joining hands together. And I still believe in 10 years to come, if we join hands together, we'll bring back snow of Kilimanjaro. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.